get to chapter 9, Daniel has gone through two Babylonian kings. He's outlived two Babylonian kings, Nebuchadnezzar and his son. And he's now under the Medo-Persian rulership. So he's got a new king and a new nation. Uh, the Medes and the Persians have come in. They've taken over Babylon. And of course they, the, the uh, Israelites were exiled to the Babylonians. So now they're the custody of the Medo-Persians. And Daniel wonders what's going on. He goes back to the book of Jeremiah. You know, his pastor teacher was in the homeland and was sending doctrinal lessons over. And um, so he's gone back to review some of the lessons sent by his pastor Jeremiah. And he's into the 29th chapter of Jeremiah according to what he's thinking about. And he's reviewing the, the fifth cycle under the Mosaic Law of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. You know, like the Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. He's gone back and reviewed that. He's gone back to see what his pastor, Jeremiah, has taught him about the 70 years of captivity and what the promises of God were because he's been in captivity a long time. By the time we get to Cyrus, uh, he's been there 67, 68 years, maybe even longer. We're not quite sure. I mean, we got dates, and so we're, you know, playing with dates, about 605 to 539 by the time Cyrus is under control of it. And uh, so he's, he does what a, a good spiritual mature believer does when things, when the furniture in your life begins to move around and you go like, what's up? Then you go to the Word of God to find out what's up. And so that's exactly what he's done. As a spiritual mature believer, it's exactly what he's done. And so we, we, he's gone through this prayer, right? Uh, at the evening hour, uh, the evening offering, they have one in the morning, one at night. He's gone to the evening offering. He's done his offering. He's in prayer and he's studying. He studied, reviewed, and then he's taking his case. His prayer was an interesting prayer. I went ahead and God recorded the whole thing, so I thought I ought to pay attention to it. And, and uh, one of the things you have to know is 1 John 5, 14, and 15 if you're going to pray and have an effective life. Uh, if you pray, you must pray according to the will of God. So that's what Jeremiah has done. And when you read his prayer, he gets really, I mean, it almost looks like a lawyer because he is stating the word of God as you, as you have promised me, Father, I'm, I'm bringing it back to you. So he's speaking the language of the Father, which is the word of God, isn't he? I mean, if you're going to have an effective prayer life, you've got to speak the word back to the Father. And... Um, that's why spiritual mature people have such an effective prayer life. And, and even though they may not think that highly of it, everybody around them does. You know that, right? And who do they call? I mean, they call you. Uh, they contact you. Well, so we went through the prayer, and now, verse 20 through 23, he says, Now while I was speaking and praying... And confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, that's fifth cycle business, and presenting my supplication, you remember prayer and supplication of verses 1 through 19. While I was presenting my supplication before the Lord my God on, on behalf of the holy, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, you know, that's, that's the that's the temple mount. That's the temple mount. Uh, and that 
is a reminder here to him how important prayer is. And the important, what he has learned is that how do you pray when you're out of the land when you've been taught to pray in the land a certain way? You go to the, you know, if you can go to the temple, you go to the temple and you pray three times and yada, yada. And, and so he found out that God is everywhere, <laughs> right? Like we all do. I mean, he's just as powerful in the hospital from your bed as he is from the pew of the church, isn't he? Because, because he is who he is. So <clears throat> then he says, while I was still speaking in prayer, then a man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, which is in the eighth chapter, like verse 16 and others. Then the man, Gabriel, whom I'd seen in a vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instructions and talked with me, and he said, O Daniel, I have come forth to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, in that, that that's the beginning of his prayer. Look, watch this. The command was issued from the throne of from the throne of God, right in heaven. That's where he stood, that's where he was present. The command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. That's a really important title that he's been given. That that's evocative of address. And he's going to refer to him now as O Daniel, high esteemed. You'll see it. Uh, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. And that's a setup for where we're going to the 70 weeks. But I feel I need to talk about Gabriel's visitation. I mean, who is this Gabriel? That he brings an answer to the prayer of God, of the prayer of Daniel. He brings the answer to it. Then tells him how, how he has to prepare himself to get the answer. Now, you'd probably think that'd be quite quite an event in your life if you could be praying in your house or your automobile, and boom, Daniel would show up. Probably shouldn't be in your automobile if that happened. <laughs> that'd, that'd be probably worse than talking on a cell phone. That'd probably be. But, but listen, you've got one greater than Gabriel that's with you every day of your life. Can never leave you nor forsake you. Third member of the Godhead lives inside your body. You have more influence in your present state of the ministry with the ministry of the Holy Spirit than you would have over Daniel, or over Gabriel. I mean, sometimes we read this and go, oh, 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 boy, if I had, if Gabriel visited me, it changed my life. I don't know how much has the Holy Spirit changed your life. That's what he's there for, isn't it? To bring you into a compatible likeness of Christ through the Word of God, molding you into a mature believer. I don't know. Sometimes, you know, we ought to be content with what we have, shouldn't we? Well, anyhow, Daniel is. I, he said, uh, at the be very beginning, I was commanded to leave my post and uh, to go on a foreign mission trip. So here I am. And he, he, he addresses him, highly esteemed of God. That's quite a title. I've come to, and, and so, I've come to give you uh, insight and understanding. So you need to heed the message. That would be my prayer for us tonight. Let's heed the message, right? Let's heed the message because one greater than Daniel is here, and that's not me, of course, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay? So let's pray. Classroom etiquette, you can't study the Bible carnal or as an unbeliever, it makes no sense. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people with spiritual information for spiritual living. So I would encourage you to understand that principle. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. 
1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your bodies become the temple of God. John 14, 16, he indwells you forever. And his great ministries teach you the word of God, not only for learning, but for living. He is the key. 1 John 1, 9 would be in order. How do I know if I'm spiritual or not? Well, if you're carnal, it's, you have evidence of personal sin. Could be mental attitude, sin, sin, so the tongue of earth sin. How do I deal with it? 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sin. We saw Daniel in his preparation for prayer, confessing sin. First John 1 John 1.9, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So, Father, we bring our priesthood before you, wanting to study under the spiritual inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he might teach us truth, truth would set us free from the cosmic system of lies that are stony blocks in our life. Gabriel shows up. Gives Daniel great insight because he lives in the old covenant, under the old covenant, not under the new covenant, as we do. So I pray the Holy Spirit would teach us under the new covenant the truth, some of the insights between this conversation between Gabriel and Daniel that would be incited for our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... Daniel has finished apparently studying Jeremiah 29. If you study Jeremiah, you see the why that's probably the part of that, what he was reading and praying over. He was certainly interested in uh, the fifth cycle under Babylon and the fact that it would be 70 years. Jeremiah had told him 70 years. And... Um, He's been counting them down and uh, feels like he's in short timing. So when you have a chance, go back and look at Jeremiah 29. It would be helpful to you. And of course, that led to that study led to his prayer in the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 19. Uh, if, while you have your Bibles there, go, go back and take a look at verse 3. Um, Verse 3. I'm not finding what I was after. I'll come back to it. I can't find what I was after. I'll, I'll come back to it. it. Apparently it's not important. Let's see, maybe, let me look one more time. Look at, look at verse 15 in his prayer, 15 and 16. Actually, the, the, key word is, the key word that you and I are both familiar with is in verse 7, the word therefore. The Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it in on us, for the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all of his deeds which he have done, but we... We didn't obey his voice. Look at the words, and now. He does it in 15, 16, and then he comes back 17 through 19. Watch this little phrase, but now. And now, our Lord, our God, who has brought the people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has made a name for thyself, as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all thy righteous act, let now thine anger and thy wrath Turn away from the city Jerusalem, the holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach to all of those who are around us. This is part of what he says in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people of Israel. Then he comes back in verse 17 through 19. So now... 
our God, to listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications for your sake, O Lord. And listen, did God, did God do that? That's what Gabriel said, wasn't it? It's exactly what Gabriel said when he showed up. He said, while you were still doing that, I was, I, I was given the command, um, for thy sake, O Lord, let thy face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes, and see our desolation, and the city which is called by your name. See, listen, this is an intercessory prayer, and it, when you hear spiritual mature believers in the Bible like Abraham make intercessional prayers, it is amazing. And it is, it's amazing how it affects the heart of God towards change. You remember Abraham with Sodom and Gomorrah and that business. But it's, a similar, it's similar when you read this. You go like, wow, I've heard this type of stuff before in other places. And certainly you have. The city was called by your name. You are not presenting our supplications before thine on account of any merit of our own. We, we are not presenting our supplication because of any merit on our own, but on account of your great compassion. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. Notice that all of those are exclamations, aren't they? For thine own sake, O my God, do not delay because thy city and thy people, which are called by your name. And listen, when he gets through, he's exhausted. When he gets through with this prayer, um, he's exhausted. He's exhausted at the end of that prayer. So it was a pretty, pretty extensive prayer. It, it very similar to the prayer, very similar in exhaustion to the prayer that Jesus had in Gethsemane. Right? When we read that prayer. So anyhow. Uh, so, you know, for one thing, it would, look, at, for one thing, maybe when you read stuff like this, I'll tell you what it does to me. It challenges my prayer life. Challenge them by prayer life. I go like, wow. Wow. And listen, this is not a prayer life you just drop in on. It's a prayer life that's developed in you to come this place. I mean, I mean, he didn't start out running 26 miles in his prayer life. He started out running a half a mile and then ran to a mile and five miles. I mean, this is stuff that's developed because it's developed through your knowledge of the Word of God, praying to God and getting the answer back, and th soon you find how that stuff works. So that when you make your prayers, you expect the answer. You don't look, you're not looking for it. You know it's there. Right? And, um, but I, when, I, when I read stuff like this, I go like, wow. Wow. He's spending a little more time with the Lord rather than his word, maybe. Yeah. So, this, I don't know. This is how it affects me. Um, we're told that this prayer was offered at the evening offering, which is a whole other ball game. And so I wrote down something about this evening offering business where prayer is offered as well. In Exodus, notice that on your paper, Exodus 29 38 through 41, and then verse 46. This again would be worth your prayer, I mean, worth your study time. We're told that Daniel's intercessual prayer was interrupted. Look at, look at, while I was still speaking and praying and confessing sin, I was, I was interrupted. Hmm? This is a good interruption, I guess. I mean, the Father, that was quite a long prayer. This was a long prayer. I don't know how long it took, but when he got through, he was exhausted. This is a pretty long prayer, and the father interrupted it. He's I've, apparently, well, look, I've heard enough. Let's let's act. I mean, this is Daniel. He apparently is going to go on and on and on. I don't know. I don't know, but the father goes like, I got it. Let's go. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, that's the kind of stuff I think about. One of the things that's really of interest to me is in verse 23. And I wrote this down because I think it's this significant. At least to me it was. 
at the beginning of his supp- at, in the beginning of his supplications, the command was issued, and I've come to tell you. I mean, when God is ready to to move on something, I mean, this is why we have to be wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. It may be a short wait. It may be a long wait. But it'll always be in perfect timing. That too you need to know about your prayer life. Right? It will happen. I mean, that's a given. But so here he is. He's not even, his prayer is interrupted. And uh, God is down there ready to move forward on it. Right? Sends Gabriel, let's move forward on this. Go down there and give the answer to the prayer. But there's some details to the answer. Of the, listen to me. There's some details that he doesn't get, that he hasn't got yet. I want you to get down there and give him some details. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he gave me good stuff to move the heart of God. But now God says, but there's some things he's going to have to be buffed up on. I love that. And don't you love that about God? He said, I'm going to answer your prayer, but at the same time, I'm going to send you to Bible study because there's a few things that you're going to have to get under, get under in order for this to all work out the way God wants it. And then at the end, he sends, he sends somebody that says your prayer has been answered, but there's got to be some explanation to it in order to get it completed. I just, I just find that to be interesting. Apparently a lot of things are to me. But um, then he gives him, he gives him a, a um, evocative of address. This means, this is really important now. This means that before he ever left the throne, God told him how to address him. And listen, that's not unusual between God and Gabriel and who he sends Gabriel to talk to. Because Gabriel is the, is the messenger of Christ. This is... This is a title of what we call super grace acknowledgement from God. This is a spiritual mature person. I'm going to talk about it who's reached a status with God of spiritual maturity, of consistent. He's no longer up and down, back and forth, none of that business. He's in. I am in, God. I'm in this deal. I'm in this deal with you. A spiritual mature believer, we call that person that he is in. None of more of this up and down and back and forth and I'm not I'm sliding into second and third when don't need to be. I just thought I should. Now that business. He's called highly esteemed by God. That's a very interesting title. Then he says, he addresses him this way, just like he did Mary. He addresses him with this unique title of super grace status and then says, so give heed to the message. You're the man for the hour. You're the man for the hour. You're the man for the hour. You're, you're, the, you're the guy. You've been highly esteemed. You've been highly chosen. Now get up, get ready for the task that sets before you. We're not going to send somebody else to do it. You're the guy. I'm sending you. Oh, send somebody. I know I'm sending you. I mean, send somebody else. Now I'm sending you. Sending you. And so this is important. This is that that's that word highly esteemed. You're equal to the task I'm going to set before you, no matter how big it sounds to you. So I, I want to deal with five aspects tonight of this idea of Gabriel's visitation, what it means to this man, Daniel. Remember, oh, the old guard is gone. 
Babylon is no more. They've been conquered. And a new sheriff's in town. And a whole new deal. Point number one. Gabriel was one of three archangels named in the Bible. We have, that, that is the English Bible. We have Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. It is interesting, Lucifer was never a title. It was a description. It was never a title. It became a title. It became a title. We'll talk about it. Um, the Jews believe there were seven archangels, but the Bible doesn't declare them. So I only go with what the Bible declares. I don't go with outside sources. But here's a, here's a passage that's interesting to us all. 1 Thessalonians, it's not in your paper, but 1 Thessalonians 4.16, dealing with the rapture of the church, with the voice of the archangel. Isn't that interesting? 1 Thessalonians, what verse? 4.16. Sixteen. You know, that's that famous passage, the shout. The Lord will descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. There is dispute, there is a lot of dispute within Christianity about the archangels and all of the establishment of angels. We know some things about these three that are mentioned in the Bible. We believe they're archangels because in Jude 9, Michael is called an archangel. He's called one. He's called an archangel. Therefore, Michael and Gabriel are the two big ones, aren't they? To us, they're the two big ones of the Jewish age. So we believe that if we can safely say if Michael is identified as an archangel, certainly Gabriel was. Now Gabriel's never called one. Well, Michael is, but we assume that. And we, we think that's a fair analogy because he was sent by God. He's always sent by God. He's never on his own, Roman. Never on his own. He's always sent as an archangel. We do know this about Gabriel. When he shows up, he's always got a messianic message. He's always got a message of Christ. Always. We know this about Michael. Michael is the military commander of God. If he shows up, whew, there's going to... Man, things are going to start flying around. Lucifer was the fallen angel out of eternity past who is also called in the Bible... The great dragon in Revelation 12. He's called Satan and the devil. That's his famous titles. But Lucifer comes from this word right here in the Hebrew, which is in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Reading from Right to left, that's H-E-L. See, that's a E. H-E-L-E-L, Hillel. And that's, if you're reading the English translation, that's Star of the Morning. If you're in Isaiah 14, you're probably familiar with that. This is the idea of the Star of the Morning. This is the Shining One, the Star of the Morning. And... Um, this is also found in Ezekiel 28 when he's talking about Satan's fall. This was about Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 is about the fall of Satan. He's called the, the shining one. And um, it's due to the, the Latin. Lucifer is a Latin word. It's not a Greek word. It's not a Hebrew word. It's a Latin word. It comes from the Latin Vulgate. Where they gave him that name. That, that's Latin for what I just wrote on the board in Hebrew. Lucifer. But with 
the tra with the Latin translation of the Vulgate Bible and Dante's Inferno and Milton's Paradise Lost, we, we now put a capital L on it. When it comes down to us uh, in the, in the, by the King James time, the reformational aspect, by that time, it's got a capital L on it. And, and which is okay. I mean, it doesn't bother us. But <clears throat> that's how it all came into being. And Second Corinthians, now listen, here's what's important. When Paul, Paul understands this principle. So in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, when Paul talks about the devil, he says it, that he disguises himself as an angel of light. See, that's where that background, see the background to that statement is, just comes from where we've been talking. That Isaiah 14 uh, business. But these are the only three that we have in our English Bible that are identified uh, this way. Like I said, others, others have different opinions about it, but these are the only ones you can find in the English Bible. The second thing I like to talk about Gabriel is he's, 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 record, he's recorded as a messenger of Christ four times in the Bible uh, four episodes in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, that is in the book of Daniel, in the book of Daniel. Now, he might have showed up other times, but not identified by name. But by name, he's identified in the book of Daniel. And then in the New Testament, he's mentioned a lot by name. And by that, I mean that there are three references to him in the incarnation of Christ. He's mentioned Zacharias, John the Baptist's father. Gabriel shows up there in Luke 1, 11 through 20, uh, and tells him what his, John the Baptist's role will be in the coming of the Messiah. Big deal. Uh, he appears to Mary in Luke 1, 26 through 38, uh, as the birth mother of a Christ, right? And we believe... Now, he's not identified, but when he shows up uh, to Mary and uh, Zacharias, he's identified as an angel of the Lord and then identified as Gabriel. So we, and, and he's always giving out messianic message. So we, we, we assume that when he appeared to Joseph in Matthew 1 and is identified as an angel of the Lord and reveals the same information that was important to Mary is now important to Joseph, we think it's Gabriel. We're making an assumption there. His name is never identified in Matthew, but we assume that because he's so active in the, incarn in the early days of the incarnation, right? So w we assume that, okay? We assume that. Here's the third thing. Gabriel was given instructions by God how to address Daniel as a, what we call a super grace believer. Now that, you say, I've never heard that title before. I know, I know, but I'll show it to you in the scriptures so to help you understand why we call it what we call it. We're talking about super spiritual growth. When we say super grace, we've just narrowed it down to say something that I'm going to explain to you, okay? But it's a scriptural idea. Gabriel was, instructed, was given instructions by God how to address Daniel as a super grace believer. In other words, this is, Daniel needs to know how strategic he is in the plan of God by God himself. So this is like a field promotion. Now he's already got the status, but he doesn't know how God views him other than, well, I'm a believer, I love God. You know what I'm saying to you? God wants him to know when he gives a title to somebody, not a name, but a title, that's a field promotion, like in the army, how you field promote people. This is, this is a big deal. And he gives, he says, when you address him, you know, I mean, let's say, for example, that in Daniel's mind, he thinks he's a first lieutenant. In his mind. Now, it's not true, 
but that's who he th probably thinks he is. I'm a first lieutenant. Uh, you know, the general in, in my life is J Jeremiah. When Daniel shows up and salutes him, Gabriel, yeah, what did I say? When Gabriel shows up to Daniel, he salutes him as if he's a full-pledged general. He's got rank and authority with God. Like Gabriel. Right? Anytime you see the E-L on the end of a word, not necessarily that one, but other ones that end in an E-L, big deal because that's God. Gabriel, my God is strong. My God is strong. That's, Ga that's his name. My God is strong. That's Daniel, Daniel, E-O. Uh, Gabriel, I think, is he is strong with God, and Daniel is the other. But when you see the E-L on the end of the word, if it's got an X and an L, then that's pretty strong stuff. But anyhow, and so I wrote this highly esteemed as one word. Highly esteemed as one word. I wrote it on your paper, um, uh, Chamuda. And uh, he uses it in Daniel 9, and then he comes back, back in Daniel 10. He refers to Daniel. He says to Daniel, O Daniel, uh, man of high esteem. And that's now his official title. <laughs> that's just his official title. I mean, that's, you know, of course, his life will be over in chapter 12, but look, he's already been promoted. I mean, how good is that? Well, anyhow, I don't know. Um, what this means, though, for you and I, this highly esteemed title, it's a salutation, a field promotion. It's super grace status of spiritual maturity. Listen, Gabriel did the same thing with Mary. Now, he apparently does this with a whole lot of people when God gives them, tells them, here's how I want you to dress Mary. In that Luke 1 passage, he says, here's how I want you to address, and this is how Gabriel addresses her. He says, hail favored one, the Lord is with you. That's, that's a field promotion. That's, that's identifying her as a super grace person able to carry out the plan of God that has been instituted in her life. It's evocative of address. That VSF, vocative singular feminine, is what that means. And look at the perfect tense means that's her field promotion and she's got it for life. Here's the fourth thing. A super grace status, let me explain what I mean by super grace status to you so you don't think I'm absolutely nuts. Just a little bit off. Super grace status is a believer. Let me tell you how you get there. Super grace status is a believer who has who is progressed in the word of God through three stages of spiritual growth and now has chosen to maintain spiritual maturity and integrity to the end. He, he, is, he is now going to run the race to the finish. Right? Like in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 8. I'm going to fight the fight till, it's, till the last bell rings. I'm going to fight the fight. I'm going to run the course. I'm going to finish it. Right? See, th this is the idea. This is super grace guy. This is a guy, this is not a baby believer that can do that. I mean... Yeah, you got to have the maturity. You got to have the capacity of the soul to be able. God is not going to give you more than you can handle. That First Corinthians ten thirteen. But he's there's a lot more he would like you to handle if you just get on the stick. But by that you got listen. Spiritual growth develops capacity for life, the plan of God in life. So you start out a baby believer. 
Then you move to an immature believer. Then you move to a mature believer. Once you move to that mature believer, you've got to make a decision. Am I going to run the race to the end? Am I going to fight the fight until the last bell? And when you make that decision, honestly, not in some emotional, give me a G, J, give me an E, give me an S, give me, you know, none of that stuff. I'm talking about the solitary of a good, solid decision is going to carry me to end. When you do that and you maintain that, you now have hit super grace status. And that's where, listen, you may have lived 40 years in Christ to get where you are for the last five years. That last five years is when you, you don't just run, but you place. You know, you place, you get the gold, you get the silver, you get the bronze. These are the crowns and rewards. This is where they, this is where you begin to pile them up. The first stage is a baby believer. 1 Peter 2, 2 says that a newborn baby, a brethos is the Greek word there, newborn baby, he needs milk, but it has to be a, a really pure milk. It can't be homogenized. It's the mother stuff. She wants the mother stuff. Give me the real stuff. The baby gets what none of the rest of us get. Right? And it's a, a head start and a big jump. The rest of us, we're going to get milk, but it's never going to be mother's milk. Now, here's when when the when Job when Job when Satan comes before in the first chapter and second chapter of Job, remember Satan comes before the Lord and uh, he's got a list of people he'd like permission to go after. Be sure your name's on there. Be sure your name is on there. You want your name on that list. The first time he comes in, he, sh he shows a list and he says, well, I, you know, I got, I got, I got this guy, I got this guy, I got this guy, and he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Put your list away. Let's just get to the point. Put your list away. Have you considered my servant, Job? There's his title. My servant, Job. And boy, will he live that title out in the book of Job. Will he ever live that title out? Well, he says, yeah, but you've got a hedge around him. Isn't that wonderful? That God has a hedge around us when we're, when we're babies and immature and stumbling out over our own tongue and bad decisions. Then he, he, tells, he tells him why, he, why God considers him up for the battle. You've considered my, my, my buddy. Well, it shows you how arrogant the devil is. Now, God knows that Job can put a serious hurt on him. Job don't know that. He's just trucking along trying to get through from one day to the next, loving God, like most of us. But God knows it. So God wants to take, Satan's getting cocky, take him down a notch or two, and this is how he does it. He lets a, a human being with the word of God in him fight the fight and put him to the run. Run him out of town. So he says, look, you consider my, my servant Job? Yeah, 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 Job. <laughs> Can't get to him. He's got it. You, got, you, got, you got the electric, the spiritual electric fence, fence around him. Can't get in there. He said, well, let me tell you something about him. So God boasts. He says he's blameless and he's upright. I wrote these down. He fears God. He shuns evil. Listen to this word, though. This is a key to the book of Job. He maintains integrity. I'm going to tell you, when you've got a believer who main, maintains spiritual integrity before God, not man, before God, you got a super gracer that God will put his plan on their back and say, carry it to the finish line.
That's what he did with Job. So he'll do it with you and I. And it'll be the, it'll be the greatest experience spiritually of your entire life. It's what you have been building up for. When, when, don't miss that run he's going to give you. Don't miss that fight he's going to give you that's going to take you to the end. Do not miss it. Because it's made all of your Christian experience meaningful. Well, so, I, I love this. He says to Satan, he says, there is no one like him on the face of the earth. So no sense going to look at any more. Put your list away. I've set up the fight. It's set. You and my servant Job. You want it or not. I'll take it, but listen. You've got this hedge around them. But I'll tell you what. You take that hedge down. Let me get to his details of life. He'll scream bloody murder. All right. I don't think so. You want the first fight? There'll be more. You got it. You got it. Job went, went several rounds with him, right? Those weren't easy rounds, were they? But they were victorious, weren't they? So he comes back a second time, wants to set up another fight. Oh, you got lucked out. He got a couple of easy blows on me. I mean, uh, you know, the cell phone rang and turned my mind away, and he, he got a good shot on me. Yeah, so he comes in a second time, goes through the same thing. Have you considered my... Have you, don't you love it? He goes, like, have you considered my servant Job? Job. And they go, like, yeah, so what? Got a lucky punch. <laughs> well, there's no one like him on the earth. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's blameless. He's upright. He lo fears God. He shuns evil. He maintains integrity. <laughs> Let me tell you. They all scream when you get to their flesh. Let me peel some flesh off of them. Let me peel some flesh off of them. Let, let me have them. And he'll curse the day he ever met you. Fight's on. <laughs> because I'm telling you, there is no man like this. And when God says that, that's, that's for sure. Job didn't say that. <laughs> Fight's on. And that's the rest of the book, isn't it? That fight went. Went the full length. I mean, Satan didn't knock him down, he'd get up. He'd knock Satan down. He'd get up. Satan knocked him down. He'd get up. Boom. That fight went on, on, and on. It was brutal. But God was right about him, wasn't he? You know why? God don't pick a fight like that unless you got the maturity to run the race, to finish the fight, and get, get to the end of the course. God would never pick you. First, First Corinthians 10, 13 says he would never have picked you for that fight. If you're a baby, he gives you a baby. I mean, he don't even talk about fighting to a baby. Daddy loves you. Go get some milk for mama. <laughs> Go get some milk for mama. But say when you get to spiritual maturity. So the second stage in the immature believer, his, his is going to increase a little bit. He's able to get the car and go some places. So, you know, we <laughs> keep an eye on him. Second stage, an immature believer, spiritual advancing in basic categorical Bible doctrine. He, he's an apios. The Bible calls him an apios. He drinks milk, uh, not from mother, but from a cow or a goat. Homogenized or something. My aunt, we, we were raised on a farm. My aunt 
wouldn't eat chicken because she named them. We told her, don't name the chickens. You're going to eat them tomorrow. Don't call them by any names. She wouldn't drink any milk because it came from a cow. But we could go, listen, we could get a bottle from a neighbor that bought from the store. We could bring it home, fill it up, cool, cool it down, and give it to her, and she'd drink it. It was the darndest thing. I would say to her, she was four years older than I was, I would say to her, Nancy, I guess I was probably the little Satan with a little S. You know that came from the cow out in the barn. And then my, my grandmother, you could see her go like, oh, geez. But I had to do it. I just had to do it. I couldn't stand it thinking. Well, anyhow. In Hebrews, the, the fifth chapter, 12 through 14, you're going to have this laid out. And that's really interesting for you to read. Now, this person, the immature believer, he's drinking milk, not from the mother, but drinking milk from whatever, and meat. And he's described, the, he's described this immature believer is described in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 2, and 11, as an apios. Once a spiritual mature believer reaches and maintains spiritual maturity, in spite of the adversities of his life, he still, nothing gets him, nothing is going to get him away from the Lord. That's spiritual maturity. Listen, by the time you get spiritual maturity, whatever he puts on your plate, you can handle. I don't care. It may take your breath away for a little bit, but you can handle it. You can handle it. You've got the moxie. You've got the spiritual savvy to be able to deal with anything that God puts on your plate. Nobody puts it on your plate but God. You learn that from Job. It don't, it don't, listen, if he passes off on something to pass through your life, it's a good thing. All things work together for good. It's, not a, it's never a bad thing. It's always a good thing. And the spiritual mature believer is beginning to understand that. And he's buying into that program. And no matter what is passes, no matter what passes through his life, he is able to gather himself up, be able to breathe the word of God back in his life, right? Once he gets over the shock, it is able to deal with that thing in the most honorable with spiritual integrity that could ever be. And he will move forward. He will, that person will move forward in their life. While other people in their life may not, he will. And he, and he will know he's better for it. Or she. All right? Now, once he reaches spiritual mature, he's got to make a decision. When you reach spiritual maturity, you've got to make a decision. Because that, now we're in high cotton, right? In the South, we know we're in high cotton. It's time to pick it, isn't it? We're in high cotton. I used to say high cotton. They, they, they say, you know what that means? I was like, how would I know what that means? <laughs> I never, I got, we never talked about high cotton in the North. But anyhow, so they had to explain it. Well, anyhow. When you reach that, when you reach spiritual maturity in your life, you got to make a decision. That decision, I explained to you, that decision is, will I run the race to the finish? Will I fight the fight till the last round, till the bell rings? Will I do that? Am I equipped to do it? Yes. Has the Bible encouraged you to do it? Yes. But will you do it as volitional? Will you do it? And I tell you, when you say yes and go like, I'm in for the ride, I am in. I am in. This is where, listen, you may have lived, you, like, like Moses, you may have lived 80 years to have 40. You, you may have lived 20 years to have 30 like Joseph. I mean, just magnificent, powerful. As far as the plan of God, I'm not talking about your human life. I'm talking about your spiritual life where you are able to see things, how God does things, how he operates in the most magnificent way. You get actually to see him in Technicolor. Not secondhand information. This is firsthand information. You do not want to miss that in this life. You want to be one of those people that God says, there's no one on the earth like this person. And when he says, 
And listen, you'll know when he believes that because he's going to put something on your plate to go like, it'll take your breath away. And then you, then you get back on your feet. You get stable in your faith and you walk it out. Because that's when, that's when your influence on history, on your life, on your family, on your church, on your community, that's when it has a rippling, powerful effect. So this is really important. This, 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 person, this person is a person who has understood inhale, exhale of the Word of God and is stable in it. Uh, you know, I inhale, I, you know, all Scripture is God-breathed. You know, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, and it's a regular daily thing in your life. That was for Daniel, wasn't it? it? It was for Job. It is for everybody when they hit spiritual maturity. You've got to learn it. You'll never get there. If you don't learn that the Word of God is both to be learned and lived, and you've got that system going in your life every day in a consistent way, that's spiritual maturity. Now, no matter what passes your plate, you know that this is impact stuff. Whatever's coming through your life is impact stuff for God. No matter, and listen, whatever it looks like is not what it is. Job got in all kinds of health issues, right? I mean the worst kind. I mean everybody just went, oh, Job, why don't you just kill yourself? Why don't you just do it, take it? Oh, Job, 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 Job. It was never about that. Right? It's not what it was about. And finally, he goes like, ding, ding. And when it finally goes like, ding, ding, then God shows up and explains it to him at the end of the book. He goes in there and says, okay, now you've got ears to hear, let's listen. You've been whining and crying. I understand that. This has been a tough run. But look, I'm going to explain this to you. And Job saluted, got it, and what did God do? God blessed him beyond his wildest dreams. Now listen, that blessing may come in time. It will, listen, it may come in time, but it will sure come in eternity. We don't know what Daniel got, but I know, I know from Hebrews 11, chapter 33, where he's mentioned in the lion's den, that God saluted him and went, cha-ching, that a boy. And that was part of preparing him for highly esteem. That way back in what, sixth chapter? Once a spiritual mature believer reaches and, it, and has chose to maintain spiritual maturity in the Christian light in spite of all this, he has reached what we call super grace status. This is recorded in 2 Thessalonians 1.3 in the Greek. Because your faith, the word he there is a definite article, H-E, that's a definite article talking about the faith. That is the faith that comes by hearing, understanding, believing, has now become a system of faith in your life. The Word of God is now a system working in your life. You understand that? We call it the faith cycle here. The faith cycle. Because your faith, watch this word, is greatly enlarged. But let me show you the two words. See the word hooper? That's a preposition. In the English, we call it super. It means up and beyond. I can throw the ball farther than anybody. Well, I don't know about that. How far can you throw it? He throws it, you know, and hits the moon and goes like, whoa. Can you throw it across the plate? That's my next question. But super, super, the super is out beyond the normal. Anything that's normal, super is way out beyond it. Would you, would you understand it? So the business world has capitalized on that principle, haven't they? They call it supermarkets and super deals and and all that. Well, this is the word. It's hooper. And then oxano is the word for growth. And so it's called super growth. So we call it super grace growth. See? So that's where that comes from. Uh, 
the whole idea in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in knowledge and grace. Grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord. Grow in knowledge and grace. See, grace is God is able. Whatever you said he do, God is more than able to do it. Just sit and relax. Have a relaxed mental attitude. Go ahead and have a cup of coffee. and It's, it's going to be okay. You're not in charge. You never have been. Every married man ought to know that. Man. Every married man. So, what we, I, what we have seen in this Gabriel's visitation is a field promotion. God has now identified him in the angelic conflict as the man. And, uh, and every time Daniel shows up and talks to him, that's how he addresses him. He addresses him as, you know, uh, like all people in the military. You're a, you're a lieutenant, you're a colonel, you're a general. <laughs> and he refers to him by this title, this title of super great status. And it's a, it's a, but yeah, let's have a word of prayer. As we close this hour in uh, prayer for those who are visiting with us by the internet, let me encourage you uh, to pull down the notes from this lesson to help you because we go so fast through material here, you need to go back and take a good look at it. You need to understand spiritual growth and maturity. You need to understand why it's important not only for your life in your relationship with God, but your effectiveness in the world in the plan of God. I mean, God has Daniel strategic. This man is going to go through He's going to be a, a minister to the Jew, to the Babylonians, to the Medes, and the Persians. As a captive, as a POW, he's going to have an impact on all four of these races of people, of nationalities. And, and he's going to impact the, the nation, the, these nations for God I mean father that's so far out there I mean I, I'm confident it's it's that far out for Daniel I mean he's just he's just a POW trying to get from one day to the next but he's faithful he's reached super grace status He's maintained it. He's never let adversity affect him. He's never gone with the wind blowing this way or that way. He has stayed consistent and faithful. And he's being rewarded for it because he's a true great soldier of Jesus Christ. May we be those people that reach spiritual maturity and then make a choice. A lot of people reach spiritual maturity, but they never make this choice to run the course, to finish the race, to keep the faith. They don't choose to do that. May we be those people that make that choice when we realize we've reached that status unto dying grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.